beloved, welcome back to the shop. As you probably figured out, we are safely back at home. Mr. Brian and I, if you didn't know, uh, flew to Tennessee, uh, tied in with Grindstone Ministries. That's a subsidiary of um, Bear over at uh, Refuge Medical uh, to assist with the Hurricane Helena disaster relief. I wanted to share my story, uh, or not my story, I guess my experience um, and how I came to find myself there. And then at the end of this, <clears throat> I will have a, a live stream uh, that you can jump on and um, uh, ask any questions that you want to know. When this hurricane uh, kicked off, I don't know why, but this particular one, I really felt um, pulled on my heart and, and I really wanted to try to do something. My initial thought was to load up some of our equipment uh, in the dump trailer and uh, drive over there and see if we could assist with, with, with whatever. When I looked at the map or I, I went on my phone and looked at the drive time, it was going to be 11 hours of drive time both ways and that just, I just can't spend that much time away from my home. My, my main obligation is to my, my family. So. The second best thing would be to jump on a plane and go down there and uh, see if, um, if, if we could just do something. The problem is I didn't know anyone and I didn't want to show up uh, and I was seeing conflicting reports online. Some people were saying come down, other people were saying don't come down, you're just going to get in the way. It dawned on me after thinking about it that I did know someone down there or knew of someone down there and that was uh, TJ or Bear from uh, Refuge Med Medical, a fellow YouTuber. Uh, I had some correspondence back and forth with his company. They'd sent me some, some first aid kits and um, I just had emailed back and forth. But I remembered uh, seeing that they were into hurricane relief because I'd seen that on his channel one time. I think there was a tornado and him and his guys were down there, um, were helping out. And so I found the website, Refuge Medical, and on the front tab they had uh, an option for volunteering. I filled it out, said uh, who I am, and, um, and sent it off and waited to hear back. Now I knew that they were completely inundated, uh, overrun, with, overrun with applications and people wanting, so I wasn't expecting to hear anything back. And I told Mrs. W what I was doing and the first day went by and she kept hounding me, you know, asking me, you know, did you hear back? Did you hear back? And, no, no. And she kept after me, was really getting after me about it. Well, like I told her, you know, what do you want me to do? I, I don't know anyone there. I don't have anyone's phone number. And, you know, I was kind of thinking in my mind, well, I, I did what I can, you know, and uh, if I don't hear back, uh, you know, that's what am I supposed to do about it? After about three days, she said, do you mind if I look into it? Now, Mrs. W has a special skill of uh, she is a super sleuth online. And I said, no, that's fine. If you can get, get a hold of someone, uh, uh, go for it. Well, it didn't take her very long. And I, actually, I, actually, I misreported in the interview uh, yesterday that, it w that she got a hold of um, uh, TJ's wife. I think it was TJ's mother-in-law. Somehow, she got a hold of TJ's mother-in-law and got me a direct number to him. And he's on the ground there at the FOB. I sent off a text uh, saying what I, who I was. Uh, and I heard right back from him. Uh, he said, come on down. And I thought, oh, <laughs> I guess, I guess, you know, you, it's one thing to have the idea. It's a whole nother to actually make the plans to do it. I didn't really want to go down by myself. Um, so I contacted uh, my best friend, Brian, uh, at the war band who lives next door to me. And I said, would you be interested? And he said, absolutely. So the next morning over breakfast, Mrs. W and I uh, jumped on the computer and booked airfare for, uh, for Brian and I and, and a rental car. Uh, to, to, I think, Knoxville, Tennessee. We flew in. Uh, Mr. Peter, bless him, uh, got up at 2 o'clock in the morning. Uh, we loaded up our gear. Uh, drove to, he drove us to the airport, dropped us off, and we flew out 5 o'clock in the morning, and that was Friday, last Friday. Traveled most of the day, got to Knoxville, rented a, a pickup truck, and threw our gear in it, and drove about hour and a half, two hours uh, to the FOB, and by then it was evening well into the dark. Rolling in, I didn't have any idea what to expect. I, uh, being kind of a veteran of big wildland fire camps, you know, they're, they're, they're huge and you have a lot of different organizations going on there, and, and I just figured that 
when I when we saw it, just the size and scale of what I saw with pallets of supplies and 50, 60 cars and a staging area with heavy equipment, I figured, well, this is a multi uh, organization effort. This is tremendous. Uh, I had no idea that that was completely 100% Grindstone Ministries. That's TJ's outfit, Bears. Well, we rolled in and um, met a, a very nice young man by the name of uh, Jason. Uh, who was waiting for us. I texted, texted them that we were 30 minutes out, uh, and he gave us a, a kind of a brief tour around there. We started uh, meeting a few of the folks. Uh, they had uh, set aside a room for us at the church. I think we had the children's, uh, the kindergarten children's Bible study room, and we had uh, cots and sleeping bags and a case of water, and all of our needs uh, met, and, and, th and that was basically it. Well, the following day was uh, Saturday, uh, which is the Sabbath. Now, Bear and, and his inner circle and his friends, they are Sabbath keepers as well as we are. And as is our custom, we don't work, do work on those days. Now, I like how they put it. As Bear said, we're not going to be doing any work. However, if a need arises, if there's an emergency, we're certainly not turning anyone away. If we can do good on the Sabbath, then we will do it. And that's appropriate. The good book says that man was not made for the Sabbath. The Sabbath was made for man. But in situations of emergencies, it's okay to do work on the Sabbath. And I was very glad to hear that. That's very much in alignment with, with the way that, that I work. But um, that day, uh, we really had, it was nice to have a day after traveling to kind of uh, get tied in, uh, to get briefed on what was going on, and, and to meet the folks that were there, the volunteers as well as TJ's staff. Had a wonderful get-together at about noon. Uh, TJ led a Bible study, uh, and it was very well attended, and was just, it was nice because it further helped us to, to, to tie in and to meet the folks that were there and working behind the scenes. I can't tell you what a professional organization this is and how tight it's ran. I, I was really, really surprised. There was a, an operations center. Uh, full of very serious guys, a lot of ex-military, tier one operators, MMA fighters, uh, all, all sorts of very high performance, high, high, high speed dudes uh, that were volunteering their time. Some are employed, some most are not, uh, at a very organized command structure, uh, handling intelligence, handling uh, the, the latest news, running down leads, creating missions for ops teams. So just the overarching view, what you have at the top is you have an op center and you have men right there. You have ham radio operators. You have really solid comms guys. Uh, you have guys that are uh, fielding information as it's coming in and trying to ascertain whether it's a credible uh, mission or a credible target or it's not. And then you have um, uh, logistics, which was handling an unbelievable amount of product coming in from all over the country. I think at one time I heard we had 59 pallets of water. That was the tip of the iceberg. We had a full fuel station. We had guys coming in from Wisconsin, from uh, Colorado, from Washington State, all over the country bringing their very own equipment. I talked to pilots that flew in from um, Nebraska, uh, crop dusters on their own dime <clears throat> flew their jet ranger in and plugged themselves in and they were delivering uh, cadaver dogs and, and search and rescue people all on their own dime. Uh, it was an incredible thing to behold. <clears throat> it's, I may have this wrong, this is my understanding, uh, but how it seemed to work was the op center was the brain of everything and as they got credible targets that was filtered down to the um, uh, to the field guys, uh, and that, that, that was uh, basically task force, task force of small groups of men and women uh, that included um, uh, an officer radio or a ham, um, an EMT or a nurse, a medical professional, and then two men, oh, my light turned off, I'm going to change my battery, two man saw teams and heavy equipment operators. In the morning, it was Sunday morning, um, I, uh, my friend Brian and I were made up, made ourselves up, uh, or they made us up uh, uh, as a saw team. Uh, we didn't have, because we traveled on the airplane, we couldn't bring our own chainsaws, but we brought our, our chainsaw chaps, our followers belts, our personal equipment, and uh, TJ uh, loaned us the, uh, his saws. They had, uh, you know, an, um, a 
a, a kind of a disaster trailer and uh, opened up the door. <laughs> it was pretty amazing. I walked in with TJ and he was going to get me hooked up with saws and uh, he started pulling saws out of the cabinet and he said, what would you like? Would you like a, a 462? 462 was the first thing that I heard and I thought, well, that's, that's what I have. So I'm like, yeah, I'll, I'll take that. He said, or would you rather have a 660 or an 880? And I thought he was joking. You know, I was like, oh yeah, that's funny. You know, like you would have those monster saws uh, here. Like East Coast man would, or Midwest man would have those monster saws. Well, when, uh, you know, he, he was obviously very busy and I said, I'll tell you what, I, I can take it from here. I got it. Uh, we'll get get the guys equipped. Go do what you got to do. You know, he had b b bigger fish to fry than to hold my hand through there. But when I opened up the saw cabinet, indeed there were 660s uh, and 660 and an 880 with a 60 inch bar. And uh, looking at his equipment and how they set things up, uh, if you know, you know, uh, you know what. And my dad was a contractor. My granddad was a mechanic. And I can look at a man's tools and how he sets himself up and what he buys. And I can tell straight away if he knows what he's talking about it or he doesn't. And I can, assure, I can tell you assuredly, uh, TJ and crew know exactly what they're talking about and they have everything very squared away and locked down and it was quite impressive. We got ourselves equipped. Uh, I'd rented a, a crew cab Dodge a two wheel drive pickup through the saws in the back. Um, I grabbed things that I thought that I could use, uh, some bull rope, uh, axes, few basic tools, water and supplies, tied in with our task force under the leadership of Jason and uh, we got our targets and out we went. Um, everyone had great radio communications. Shout out to Evan at Radio Made Easy. We would not have been able to do this without the radios that he's equipped us with and he pre-programmed everything and I just don't have the credit, I, I just can't express the gratitude or express the gravity of the importance of what Evan has done setting us up as well as putting a lot of effort into Grindstone as well as I was told. Um, a tremendous, tremendous thank you uh, to Evan. Uh, so many to thank, but to him in particular was very beneficial to us. Sunday, we went out, uh, we did tree work, did saw work, uh, liberated the guys um, uh, that was, had a bunch of trees and some nasty snags. Uh, we had heavy equipment, we had two, two uh, skid steers, we, I think we even had a mini excavator. Uh, we, we rolled deep and that's where I really started to see the, 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 the level of destruction and devastation out there and it was just appalling. It was just appalling. I, I was not prepared for, I was not prepared for it. We worked out through, throughout the day, came back. Um, I also have to r really give acknowledgement to the local churches, how the local churches stepped up and made their facilities available, not only to our FOB for Grindstone, um, it was above, I mean, we really put a, lot of, uh, <laughs> put a lot of work on the congregation and a lot of wear and tear on their building. We had at one time over 100 and, 101, 102 volunteers, heavy equipment, dirty boots, you know, just trashing the place, doing the best we can, but you've got men and women that are working out in the field. Uh, but I never heard a complaint. I never heard any whining. They stepped in. They fed all these people. It was absolutely phenomenal. And the churches were, were essentially the outposts as we were out in the field when we were going out, you know, running missions, running down leads. I saw the churches um, all over the place, out in the front of all of this, the battle, uh, making their, their facility available, using, letting us use their, their, their um, yards, uh, their parking lots, their facilities. It, it was absolutely tremendous. Day two. Uh, same thing, formed up uh, Brian and I as a saw team uh, and went and uh, ran down leads. Uh, worked for um, a guy that uh, up on his farm that had a bunch of trees down that um, knocked down his fences and went up there and, and we had some really tricky trees and some such. We got that all cut out and he was able to get his fences and get his cows corralled and, and it was a, a, another great successful mission. Day three, uh, Bear's team was, uh, they had some pastoral duties and he took, you know, his inner team, his management team, they had to go back to Oklahoma uh, and he replaced it with uh, another team from Grindstone headed up by Scott, which uh, be became a good friend of mine uh, that I very much enjoyed working with and uh, look forward to having, you know, ha having, staying in contact with, with all these guys. They were a little bit shorthanded. Um, Jason, who had been leading our task force, 
uh, approached me in the morning after the morning meeting and asked me if I would be willing to, to, to take my own task force out uh, to run down three leads that he provided for me. And I said, uh, I'd be happy to. So um, I got a couple saw teams and um, a medic and some guys that wanted to help with it. And we rolled out uh, with the three trucks. About two hours, hours away, we went cross-border into North Carolina and, that's, uh, uh, and, and chased down those leads. Uh, the first guy we tied into had a bunch of danger hazardous trees um, that uh, our sawyers were able to take care of and put his mind at rest. Um, we ran down the other couple leads. Uh, I, I don't know and need to go into all the details, but uh, it was a, a successful mission. We were able to bring supplies and bring relief to folks, and that's where I really saw uh, the worst devastation. And um, folks that had, had lost so much and lost everything. As we came in after the third day, um, we had to eat, we always have a debrief, 7.30 in the evening, 7.30 meeting in the morning, 7.30 debrief in the, in the evening, um, and uh, Grindstone uh, made the call to the following day to, to hold everyone in because there was some there was some concerns for uh, folks' health. There was uh, some hazmat situations that were being reported, and until they could really get uh, a handle on what was fact and what was rumor, uh, they decided to err on the side of safety and bring everyone in uh, and hold for 24 hours. They weren't willing to risk the health and safety of the volunteers because our number one job, of course, is to get home to our families. Well, that gave us all an opportunity to really uh, uh, get the, the, for, the FOB all organized. We had so much stuff coming in and the logistics people were getting overwhelmed and we all jumped in in different ways uh, to help uh, deal with all of the product and the whole time we had people coming in and we basically had, a, had a, a Walmart set up there where people could come and get everything they need from batteries to fuel uh, to kerosene heaters to warm clothing uh, to generators. Uh, it was just absolutely, absolutely tremendous. <clears throat> we were supposed to stay, we were actually supposed to come home tomorrow, uh, Saturday, but uh, the way Grindstone is, Grindstone is, is not designed, it's not their intent to be long-term relief. They are, as we would call in the fire service, initial attack. They show in, they're fast, light, and mobile. They have tremendous capabilities. They show up and they relieve people of burdens, um, extricating driveways, organizing, all those things. When it comes into the long term, the, 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 the long recovery, I guess going from rescue to recovery, that's not re really what they're designed for. And they were starting to wind down because their role, the role that they fit, uh, was starting to, to diminish. So um, I went to... Uh, um, Scott, you know, the overhead and uh, said, you know, we're, we're here to stay, whatever you want, but, um, you know, you let us know. We had such a, an outpouring of volunteers and so many people, they were actually kind of a little bit top heavy looking for folks. Uh, you know, we're not telling you, you you have to go, but if you feel you, you, you know, if someone could step up, uh, it would take a little bit of pressure off of everyone in the camp uh, and said, so I, so I said, well, you know, we can, we bumped up our flight a couple of days and, uh, and they said, yeah, that would be perfectly fine. Uh, so, so we decided to do that. Uh, they're just, the role for us and what we could do was somewhat diminishing in, uh, at that particular area. So I'm not saying that the work is, is done there, not by any stretch of the imagination, but the, it's uh, in the area that we were at, we were, everyone, the volunteers were so effective uh, that we were having to drive over two hours outside of our area to lend help. And that puts a lot of burden upon uh, the volunteers, especially those that are dragging heavy equipment around. Um, and it's a shame to go out and drive four or five hours of driving, pulling a dump, dump truck, pulling a flatbed, an excavator when you go out there and you don't have a solid contact. So I understand, and that made, made, made perfect sense. Um, we flew back last yesterday. Uh, got in last night and you know it's one of the most impactful and meaningful things I've ever done in my life it, it is one of the it will be I will never forget it I will never forget the stories that I heard of the loss of uh, the people that came in of um, the generosity of the volunteers I mean I'm going to give you two personal stories 
And this is by no means the best or the only. It's just the ones that really touched my heart. There was a man um, on my saw team. His name was Joe. He was a local there. And he was a very quiet guy. Didn't say too much. Um, didn't really say much of anything. He was always a kind of an outlier. And you know, it, was hard, it was hard for me to read. You know, he, he, was, uh, he, was, just, he was a tough guy. Uh, just kept, kept his own counsel. And um, not, not someone that I like, like really felt a warm attachment to or, or, or friendship with. When we were, when we found our last target on day three, it was an elderly couple that had lost everything in a timber frame cabin, and we approached him, and I asked him if there anything that he could use, anything that he needed, and he said, uh, do you have a chainsaw? I need a chainsaw to start cutting and, and getting my life put back together. We didn't have one. We had our own personal saws, you know, great big professional saws, you know, not, not something that... Um, an elderly man would, uh, would probably f find useful. And Joe, who was volunteering, was on my saw team, so it came, pulled me aside and said, would it be okay if I gave him my saw? He had a small homeowner saw. It was a nice saw, a still, you know, like a 100-something series. And I said, yeah, of course, if you want to do that. And I told him, I said, uh, I will, uh, I'm sure, I, I mean, I can't speak for Grindstone. I'm, I, I'm, I, this is the first time I'd work for them, but, but I, I know Bear, and I know the people that I saw there. I said, I do believe that they, you will be made whole, um, that, we will, that they will certainly replace it. And I told him, and if they don't, I will replace it with my own money. I guarantee it. And so we went up, I set the guys up to the truck, and we pulled out a couple of extra chains, uh, got him bar oil, um, got him uh, mix, uh, walked him through how to do it. But I'll tell you, that touched me. It touched my heart. The generosity of that man, Joe, it gives me goosebumps to this point. And uh, my admiration and respect for him is unparalleled. Unparalleled. You know, and, and, I, and he would have done it. He was not expecting to be, that, to be replaced. And he was not a man of great means. I was, I think it was the second night, I was, um, it was about 12.30 at night. I was sitting outside the church, everyone was long since gone, had gone to bed. I was sitting outside the church because I was trying to get content up. Um, it was, uh, and I'm not, I'm not looking for sympathy here, it's just the way it is. I, I don't mind doing it. You, you get up early and we went out and, and worked, did tree work all day long and <clears throat> come back and meetings but you know by the time you get through the meetings and you eat dinner it's about nine o'clock or so well i hadn't yet even started editing uh videos and i wanted to get that up in real time the same day it happened and so i was uh trying to find a dark place in the corner of the church and i was in the dark you know editing and of course you know because i have a youtube channel and there's a lot of folks that saw that i was out there and a lot of young men have driven a long ways and and they wanted to they wanted to talk they wanted to share their stories and such and i will never ever <laughs> <clears throat> turn anyone down. I'm never too busy or what I'm doing is not more important than sitting down and, and visiting with folks that, that want to talk or want to share stories. Now there's a constant stream of guys, you know, and now it's 12.30 and almost 1 o'clock and finally um, Kim, uh, who is a, I think, believe she was a nurse, uh, she came in and saw what was going on and ordered the boys to go to bed and leave me alone and I was very grateful. So I got done with the editing and I was sitting outside because the internet was too slow inside uh, trying to upload this video, which was just taking a long time. And I was leaning against a concrete bullard at the front door of the church, just sitting on the asphalt there, just kind of waiting for the upload. Two guys came up. One guy I knew uh, from one of the saw teams uh, by the name of Squirrel uh, with a young man that was 19. Tall, western looking fellow, uh, cowboy boots. Uh, came up and, and they wanted to talk. And, and the words were coming out of my mouth. I was so tired. I think it was 12.30, 12.45. I wanted to tell them, you know, can this wait? Uh, I, you know, I, I got to get to bed. I got to get up early in the morning. And the Holy Ghost just spoke to me and said, just there's nothing more important here than going down and, and giving your attention to these two men. 
I closed my computer because they wanted me to come down and see something. I didn't know exactly what it was. Uh, they wanted me to come down and down to the staging and see it. I closed my computer, walked down there with him, and what I saw was one of the most generous ki acts of kindness I've ever experienced in my life. This young man, 19, drove all the way from Leadville, Colorado, that's 1,600 miles, with a Ford pickup and about a 30-foot flatbed trailer. On top of that trailer was an another Ford pickup and another trailer on top of that, completely loaded to the gills with supplies that he had, he had organized back home in Leadville, a, uh, a food drive, equipment drive, blankets. He, well, I don't know exactly what he had, uh, all sorts of things, just a mountain of equipment. He loaded all that up at 19 <clears throat> and drove all the way 1,600 miles to come and to help out Grindstone at, at the FOB. He told me his truck broke down 12 times on the way. You know, that's the type of people that were there. And, and I, don't, I, I don't have the time. There, there's, not, there's not the time in the day today to, to go over all of the similar type of situations that I experienced with this group and these good men and women that donated their time on their own bill. Uh, it was very, very humbling and very, made a strong, strong impression upon me. <clears throat> Last thing I'll close with this, I, while I was there I, on day four, um, I met a few YouTubers. I think uh, these three YouTubers are doing, also doing a good job of getting the word out of what's taking place. Um, I did an interview with Johnny B he came in and we sat down at the Op Center and I really enjoyed talking with him. I will put links to those in the description box. I encourage you to go over and subscribe uh, and watch those videos. They'll give you some good insight as to what's going on. Mr. Guns and Gadget, I sat down with him. Both of them excellent guys. We had a nice interview on, on preparedness and what I learned and what I'll be doing different uh, from my experience in t Tennessee and North Carolina. <clears throat> And 3-H Survival. 3-H Survival is a young man that uh, uh, also did very good work there. Uh, that, uh, Lord willing, I plan on doing a, a, a dual stream with tomorrow. Um, we just, we had a rapport. We had a rapport and uh, it's a friendship that I'd like to cultivate and uh, I'm very impressed with what him and his friend, I believe it was Phil, uh, were doing. They helped me out as, too, as well. And I'll put links to all those guys there. Um, for you to watch and I encourage you to do it. It's uh, quite interesting. <clears throat> the question is going to come up again. I'll close with this is uh, did you see any government there? Did you see FEMA or the army? Did you who, who was doing the work? I have to be careful here. I'm not a big fan of government and the waste and the lack of efficiency and that does bias me. Uh, so I'll just say I'll tell you what I what I know what I saw in the three days that I was out in the field. I didn't see any government, I didn't see any FEMA uh, doing any relief work. The only thing I saw was as we were going down uh, on day one, uh, I believe it was either the 82nd or the 101st Airborne passed us on our, on our way out as we were going in to help. They were on their way out, they were retreating, I was told, because they were afraid of Militia activities. Take that for what it's worth. What I did see is I saw local volunteers, I saw the churches, and I saw private groups volunteering, people from all over the country, getting all the work done and making it happen. And I personally didn't see any government working or doing anything uh, in the areas I was at. So, and again, that's a small, sm a small area that I covered. So I don't know what to say other than that. But I guess you can read between the lines if you'd like to. May God bless you and your families. Please keep us in your prayers. I am going to upload this right now. We'll start a live stream after this and uh, jump on over there and I'll answer any questions that you may have about my experience uh, working with Grindstone, working with the good people 
the good people, the good people of Tennessee and North Carolina, and that's it.